we are so excited to be joined by Nick Lund, who is Maine Audubon's Outreach and Network Manager. He is also a birding blogger under the title The Birdist. Um, and he is going to be teaching us today about Maine spring birds. My name is Abby Bradford. I am Maine Conservation Voters' new Outreach Manager. And my job is to help Mainers from across the state make our voices heard in the political process so that we can protect our common home and our future. Maine Conservation Voters cultivates and uses political power to conserve and protect Maine's environment. MCV helps pass laws that protect our environmental legacy, elects pro-environmental candidates to office, and holds our elected leaders accountable without regard to political party. A few technical notes for today's event. You are all muted and your cameras are off by default. If you are having technical difficulties, please email Greta Warren at Greta at MaineConservation.org for help. Her email is also listed in the chat, which you can access at the bottom of your screen. Um, today, uh, our agenda will be that Nick will first be teaching us about Maine Spring Birds, what you're all here for. Then he'll be answering all of your bird questions. You can send those through the chat and those questions will only be visible to Nick and I. I'll keep track of them and select popular questions for Nick to answer. After that, Nick is going to talk briefly about how birds are being impacted by climate change and I will let you all know how you can get involved in that cause. And then at the end, we'll wrap up and announce Maine Conservation Voters next Lunch and Learn event. Uh, thank you all again for joining us and I'll hand it over to Nick now. Hey folks, how you doing? Thanks for joining me. I hope everyone is staying safe. Um, I'm joining you today from uh, this beautiful sunset over Casco Bay, which is actually my um, cold and spidery wood panel basement, um, but we're trying to make do during these times. Um, I'm Nick Lunds, uh, I'm Nick Lund, the Maine Audubon's uh, Network and Outreach Manager. Um, this is me looking happy in a field. Uh, earlier today when we tested this presentation, I realized that I was wearing the same shirt as I am in this old picture. Um, so I made a, a crazy change. Uh, I didn't think that dress code was going to be an issue during these quarantine times, but, but here we are. Um, speaking of quarantine times, um, w there are birds around. So for us birders, this is actually not the worst time probably to be stuck in our houses uh, with a view of our backyards. Um, May and, uh, April and May and March even too is uh, something birders know as spring migration. It's a, a wonderful time of year. It's the time we wait for all year round um, because we have lots of birds return. The, the, the snow is gone theoretically, the cold is theoretically gone, um, and lots of beautiful birds are coming back that we can all enjoy. Um, and so this is uh, what spring migration feels like in our hearts. Uh, and, um, you know, with some information and some care and consideration, um, we can still have a, a productive spring migration just in our backyards. Uh, you'll notice uh, this Sound of Music lady, um, you know, social distancing, she's not close to anybody. Um, we can still do that right now. Um, so let's get into it. I got a lot of uh, things to cover, so I'm going to talk a little quickly, um, but let's just dive in, all right? First of all, what is migration, right? Migration is a seasonal movement of species, in this case birds, um, and it's big numbers. We're talking big numbers. So uh, in the United States, we have about three and a half billion birds coming back up from the south uh, where they spent the winter. Uh, about two and a half billion of those are uh, continuing north from the United States to uh, big forests in Canada, et cetera. Uh, in the fall, we have four billion coming south, 4.7 billion going south into Mexico and South America. Um, of course, why is that number larger in the fall? It's because all these birds are having babies. Um, so there are more, more birds in the fall. But we're talking big numbers of birds uh, moving. Um, how do they do it? Um, well, they, they, they fly across, uh, they fly. That's what birds do. Um, this is a little video of a wood thrush. Um, so uh, the colors down there in the Yucatan and in parts of Central America, that's where the bird, these wood thrushes spend their winter. Um, and this information uh, shows you how they actually migrate. And if you look on the right side there, the, that moving bar, you can see the, the months changing there. Um, so you see that uh, in about 
April and May, these birds start flooding. They fly directly over the Gulf of Mexico. Um, they, don't, uh, they don't fly up and around through Texas. They jump up over the top and um, kind of flood back through the United States, do their breeding thing, and then uh, come back down south. Um, so that's how some of these birds migrate. What are some of the birds that we're talking about? We're gonna get into some more specifics later on, but just to get us excited here up at the top, we're talking about what birds, you know, warblers are famous in the Eastern United States, um, uh, famous migrants. Warblers are a, a group of small um, insect eating birds that are in, um, varied in their plumage, they're beautiful and colorful. Um, and that when they come in in April and May, uh, it really brightens up everyone's hearts. Um, in Maine, we have 25 or more species of warblers, each with their own distinct uh, color and, and habits and song. Um, just to get us excited a little bit here, we have a, a black-throated green warbler up on the top left, a yellow warbler at the top middle, a Cape May warbler on the top right, um, a black and white warbler down below, and then a black-throated blue warbler um, on the uh, bottom left. Uh, you know, birders, you know, we start salivating when we see pictures like this, but this is coming in the next few months. But it's not just these beautiful little birds. Um, all kinds of different birds migrate, including loons, uh, famous loons around here. Um, uh, if you're a loon, of course, you spend most of the year on uh, freshwater lakes. Uh, in the winter, that becomes more difficult because those things become ice. So you gotta uh, get the heck out of Dodge. And so um, waterfowl like loons and ducks and other things that spend time on uh, freshwater have to go find open water in the winter. Um, for loons, they have it they jump down to the open ocean, which stays unfrozen year round. Uh, and so in Maine, you know, a lot of people don't necessarily know this, but um, loons are actually probably easier to see and more common in the winter uh, on our coastlines than they are on their breeding grounds on inland lakes in the summertime. Um, they look a little different, they're in a different plumage, but, um, but loons stay in Maine year round, they just get off of the fresh water. Raptors also migrate. Um, this is a beautiful little hawk called a broad-winged hawk. Uh, you can see here again that they spend their winters down, you know, some of them in Florida, but the bulk of them are down in uh, Mexico through uh, Central America. Um, I actually just saw a broad-winged hawk uh, in early March in Ecuador. Um, and that bird is probably winging its way north right now. You can see how their patterns go. They're leaving about April and May and they start flooding back through the United States um, to breed um, over the spring and summer and then head back down south. Um, one difference I wanna point out here from the wood thrush slide I showed is that uh, most raptors actually don't jump over the Gulf of Mexico. Um, they will stay over land. And so you'll see them coming up through Southern Texas um, uh, places like Southern Texas up by in Panama where it gets very narrow, you can have these huge incredible migrations of, of raptors in the spring. And I want to point out too that of course not all birds migrate. Um, I would say a, a good number is about half the birds uh, that we have around here don't migrate. Um, the reason birds migrate, as we'll talk about in a second, is to, is to eat food and mon only, uh, excuse me, mostly insects. Um, you know, one of the few benefits of a Maine winter is that we don't have many insects around. But if you're a bird that eats insects, you got to leave. Um, if you're a bird that doesn't need to eat insects, like this black-capped chickadee or that red crossbill or that uh, cedar waxwing, uh, you can hang out. And so we have plenty of birds that ride out the Maine winter because they're able to eat, um, either find insects in bark or eat fruit or um, eat other things that, that don't uh, need them to leave. You know, it's dangerous to migrate. You have to move thousands of miles. So um, if a bird doesn't need to do it, it won't do it. But like I said, this is why they do decide to do it. Um, in the spring and summer, uh, there are huge numbers of uh, things to eat uh, in the northern part of this hemisphere. Um, insects are plentiful, as we know. And so uh, if you're a bird who's trying to raise babies um, and give them plenty to eat, there are plenty of options, uh, unfortunately, during black fly season and all the other insect seasons uh, in the summer. Um, this is one example of a potential food source. This is sort of a shock slide here, but what birds are really after are these bad boys right here. Um, caterpillars are by far the most important food source for birds. Uh, which are trying to raise babies. Um, about 96% of terrestrial birds feed uh, insects, uh, mostly caterpillars, to their young. 
that includes a lot of birds that don't traditionally eat insects, um, birds that you see at your feeders like cardinals and things like that. Um, and it makes a lot of sense. Uh, a caterpillar like this is a, is a juicy little protein burrito. Um, they are plentiful in the springtime, they're easy to catch, um, and they pack a lot of nutrients into a small um, body. And so, um, uh, and they eat like tons of them. Little example here. So this is a, this is a Carolina chickadee. This is not the black cap chickadee that we have here in Maine, but a very similar species. Um, when a pair of chickadees is trying to raise babies um, in about May, June, um, those chickadee parents are spending the entire day, about 6 a.m. to 8 p.m., shuttling back and forth to grab a caterpillar, feed it to their young, grab a caterpillar, feed it to the young. Um, over the course of a day, that's a, between 350 and 570 caterpillars per day, which over the course of raising one clutch of eggs is about 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars, just for one uh, nest of small chickadee babies. So multiply that over all the birds that are nesting, bigger birds, et cetera. Um, you need a lot of caterpillars uh, in order to raise babies. Um, and I should say too, um, it's not just uh, chickadees and birds like that that eat insects. Um, I hope everyone is sitting down here for this slide because this, is, this is, will knock you off your feet. Um, we all know that hummingbirds, of course, uh, drink nectar, right? We have put those, they, they buzz over to flowers. We put, over those, put out those red feeders that they jump up to. Um, but if I were to ask you what percentage of a hummingbird's diet is made up of insects, mostly spiders, what would you say? 10, 20? It's actually between 60 and 80% of a hummingbird's diet is made up of insects. Um, this this uh, little female ruby throat here is trying to pick off a spider or maybe already has from her spider web. Um, um, insects are very important, bottom line. So uh, the real point as we're thinking about backyard birding and thinking about doing good things for our birds coming up here in the next few months is how do we get some insects? Uh, how do we get some native insects in our yard? The way we do it is we plant native plants. So I hope everyone down there writes this down in big letters and circles it in a red pen. Um, native plants are absolutely the, the, uh, the way to get the insects that birds need to live uh, around your neighborhood. Um, down here are examples of the um, two native plants which, are, which provide homes for the most numbers of caterpillars in Maine. That's a red oak uh, uh, over there on the left. Um, about 530 different species of native caterpillar can live on oaks. And that black cherry uh, on the right, um, about 450 different species of caterpillars. Um, and I should say too, when we talk about native insects, I'm not talking about um, things like uh, mosquitoes or uh, ticks and things like that. I'm talking about caterpillars, which uh, turn into moths that you don't see at night or beautiful butterflies, which are great to have around. So um, uh, please plant native plants. Um, Spiders are arachnids and insects. Thank you. <laughs> I forgot there's some technical people on the on the chat. Um, um, how does this? Why is this happening? Um, there's a lot of specialization uh, in among caterpillars and plants. Um, caterpillars eat plants. Plants don't want to be eaten, right? So over the many thousands of years, um, plants will develop defenses from being eaten, largely you know toxins in their leaves. Uh, and insects will find, uh, or caterpillars will find ways to work around those defenses so they can eat. Um, what that results in over the years is lots of specialization where an insect will figure out, um, instead of ways to break through the defenses of a lot of different plants, they'll, they'll focus on breaking through just one or two plants. Um, that means that if you don't have those one or two plants, if those, if those aren't growing, then you're not gonna have those insects because they got nothing to, to eat. Um, of course, monarch caterpillars are the, the, the prime example here. Um, everybody knows that monarch caterpillars eat milkweed, and they only eat milkweed, really. Um, if you have milkweed plants uh, in your garden, like we did last year, you're going to have monarchs on them. Um, if you don't have milkweed, you're not going to have monarchs because um, they develop this special sodium pump in their stomach that can deal with the um, toxins that are in um, uh, milkweed leaves. Um, but they have done that and, and can't get around the defenses of other plants. So um, you need some specialization. So that's, um, well, finally I should say, it, it's sort of hard to find native plants a little bit. A lot of the nurseries and, and uh, greenhouses around 
um, focus not on you know native plants but on the most beautiful plants or other cultivars that people want and so um, Maine Audubon and some other groups are working hard to uh, to change that to, to give um, to provide native plants for people to plant in their gardens uh, and to work with nurseries and places to, to have them stock them. Um, come to MainAudubon.org, uh, our Bringing Nature Home initiative, if you want to learn more about uh, what plants will work for you and where you can get them. Um, also great resources from National Audubon Society and the Wild Seed Project. So give it a look and as you're thinking about spring planting, please plant native. There's some other things too, of course. Um, you can put uh, bird seed in your backyard. That's a really popular this time of year. There's tons of different options for bird seed and bird feeders. Um, go nuts. Uh, variety is sort of uh, the best way to go here with different seeds um, attracting different types of birds. Um, I, I want to point out one important thing, which is to, when you're looking at what seed to buy, avoid something called Milo. Um, you see over there on the left, the red Milo uh, is this sort of red, round, BB-sized seed um, that is used as filler a lot in sort of inexp inexpensive seed mixes. You don't want it. Birds don't eat it. Um, some turkeys may eat it and some birds like that, but the vast majority of uh, birds that are coming to your feeders don't eat Milo. Um, but, uh, and so if it's out there, it'll just sit there uneaten. It may get moldy, blah, blah, blah. You'll be wasting your money. So um, look at your seed mix. Um, I know Maine Audubon uh, has some curbside seed pickup. We've got great mixes now. Um, any other store um, which has quality mixes will have a, a low Milo content. So look out for that. Um, but it, like I said, it's variety is what's important right now. And so uh, think about more than just bird seed in your backyard. Um, um, in, the, in about May, we'll start having Orioles back. Um, you can put out a little cup of uh, jelly, grape jelly, um, and uh, so fruit eating birds, birds that don't eat seeds, uh, will come down to eat that. So uh, a, a cup of jelly is really popular for Orioles. Um, so too is like cutting an orange in half and putting the two halves outside. Um, Orioles love to eat, eat the fruit out of there. Um, down below, uh, suet is uh, rendered fat that's like packed into these cakes. You put it in these little cages to hold it there. Uh, it's great protein for a lot of birds, chickadees, um, but woodpeckers love that especially. Um, so uh, woodpeckers and then of course uh, hummingbird feeders. Um, in Maine we only have uh, one, you know, not to denigrate the ruby-throated hummingbird, it's wonderful, uh, but we only have one species of hummingbird that breeds here, the ruby-throated hummingbird, uh, which comes uh, towards the end of the month. Um, if you want to put out uh, some bird feed or some uh, hummingbird feeders, that's great. Uh, the one suggestion we have is um, save a little money, don't buy the red nectar stuff that you see on the shelves. Uh, the birds don't see the red. Um, that's uh, just food coloring that's added and actually can be harmful to hummingbirds. And so um, just boil uh, four parts water with one part regular plain old white sugar and, uh, and you're good to go. Quick, I have to do this, uh, how to do things safely. So uh, keep your bird feeders clean, please, if you can. Um, if you're like me, um, you don't have time to keep them clean because the birds are just eating them, eating them to nothing uh, in a day or two. But if your seed sits there, if it gets wet, it can get moldy, which can be dangerous. And so um, if it gets wet, try to change about uh, once a week or so uh, and um, just keep an eye on it. Every one to two weeks uh, is preferred to, to keep your seed changed. Um, prevent window strikes birds. Um, if, they're, uh, if they're flying away or if they're startled by a hawk, they can strike your windows. Um, so that means putting your feeders uh, either very close to your windows, about three feet, or more than 30 feet away so they don't um, strike your windows. Um, also, too, if you can put um, decals or uh, ultraviolet tape on your windows to uh, let birds know that there's a window there, that it's not just a reflection of the of, uh, vegetation, then you'll also reduce strikes. And also keep them safe from predators. Um, frankly, I'm talking about cats right there. Cats are a major predator of uh, birds in our backyards. Um, if you um, don't put your feeders right in a, in a bush, if you um, don't give an area for a predator to hide, um, then you can help uh, make sure that they are feeding safely. So that's just a quick talk there. Um, a couple other quick slides um, about um, what you can do in your backyard. I guess this, this is the, the last one here before we get into some bird ID um, is uh, bird houses, right? Um, what are bird houses? Well, they're, they are, you know, not all birds build their own houses, as you know, they're not that, you know, good at construction. Um, bird houses are mimicking uh, tree cavities. Uh, and so 
uh, in dead trees, traditionally holes would be excavated by woodpeckers or other creatures. Um, and those provide great safe nesting places for birds. Um, as humans sort of don't, you know, cut down dead trees uh, and don't leave them up as much as they would in nature, um, uh, there's a there's a lot of fewer cavities out there for birds to nest in and so birds like uh, this chickadee here uh, will readily take up in a in a birdhouse um, so put those things out now now is the time chickadees may already be nesting or are going soon and so the sooner the better on getting uh, birdhouses up in your backyard but I will say this um, it takes uh, it, it really benefits you if you do a little research before you put your house up um, birds are actually pretty particular about um, their, where they live. Um, the holes need to be the, the right size or they need to be facing the right direction or they need to be um, the right distance apart from other things. And so if you go on uh, this website, I highly recommend called Nest Watch from Cornell. Um, they have all kinds of information um, for different common species that we have here in Maine and elsewhere about how to put up your bird house safely, how to, which, you know, which hole size to use, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I highly recommend doing that before you hang anything because it'll make it much more likely that you're going to have things come and join you. Okay, that's a little bit, that's a lot of background. That's a lot of stuff. Um, now I'm going to jump into this. What bird, let's, let's just talk about the fun stuff. What birds I'm going to see. Um, this was a really hard thing to put together because uh, there's hundreds of birds coming through and um, it's hard to just narrow it down to a few, but I'm going to do it. That's what I'm going to do. Um, we'll start with a couple common ones in the backyard. Um, these are two species of cute little adorable birds that um, are here year round. Um, these are birds that, that you may have been seeing all winter long and will continue to see. Um, these uh, birds love to hang out uh, right on the trunks or the branches of trees, uh, bouncing up and down, um, looking for insects and little seeds. Um, they are, of course, nuthatches. These are two of our nuthatch species. Um, uh, they are not named uh, confusingly, pretty straightforward, lots of birds are. We have two, we have the white-breasted nuthatch, that's the one with the white breast, and the red-breasted nuthatch, which is the one with the red breast and the little uh, stripe through the eye. Um, these are cute birds, they make sort of cute little honking noises um, that, you, that you may hear this time of year. So these are our two nuthatches, keep a lookout, they will readily come to feeders uh, in places where they, they live, uh, and so check them out. Of course, these are our chickadees. Um, on, uh, we have two species of chickadee in Maine, believe it or not. Uh, one of them is our state bird. Um, one of them, the bird on the left, is by far the most common of the two chickadees. It lives everywhere from, from York to Aroostook. Um, it's in our backyards, it's in the middle of the woods. Um, they're all over the place. Uh, they're non-migratory, so they, they don't leave. Um, the other, the one on the right there, is uh, a different chickadee. This is one that um, doesn't live in southern Maine. It inhabits the forests of northern Maine, so about Bangor north and through the woods of, um, you know, Katahdin and those type of places. Um, these are, of course, the black-capped chickadee and the boreal chickadee. Um, the black-capped chickadee, fairly easy to identify. If you're in southern Maine, it should be the only one you have around to look for that uh, beautiful um, sort of black and white checkerboard facial pattern. Um, the boreal chickadee, if you're out in the woods uh, in northern Maine, um, where there still are black-capped chickadees as well, the way to tell them apart is that you look at that cap, you see they have a brown cap instead of the black cap. Uh, and also down there, you see they have uh, a lot more darker color, darker sort of pinkish red on the sides. Uh, and so those are our two chickadees. A classic, a classic identification problem here for, for Maine birders. Um, these two woodpeckers, we have a couple woodpeckers in Maine. Um, these are uh, the toughest to tell apart. This is a question that all birders get constantly, which one is which. Um, we have, uh, these are females of both of the species. They look uh, similar to the males, but males will have red on the back of their head. Um, so these are females. But you see, they look almost identical. Uh, one, of the, one of the species is smaller than the other one. Um, and you'll see one has a smaller bill than the other. And that, those are key to the identification. The smaller of the two is called the downy woodpecker. And the larger of the two is called the hairy woodpecker. Um, this is one that takes a lot of time, frankly, and a little bit of experience to be able to tell. Um, it's, it's sort of evident when you see them both side by side like this, 
I can tell from tell you from experience, they don't frequently line up this conveniently for you to identify. Um, so when they when it's just one bird or the other, it can be a challenge. But um, what you do is you look at the bill. Um, the downy woodpecker has a tiny little bill that just barely peeks out of the feathers on its face. Um, the hairy woodpecker has a longer bill. It really juts out there um, and uh, it looks stronger. Um, the size thing is difficult, um, but I mean, this is just a thing that works for me. I don't know if it's going to work for you. When I see a downy woodpecker, I'm like, oh, that could fit in my pocket. When I see a hairy woodpecker, I'm like, that couldn't fit in my pocket. So uh, I, the, the pocket test is informal, um, but it works for me. If you see a bird, you're like, that doesn't, I'm not putting that anywhere near my pocket. That's probably a hairy. If you're like, that could probably slip in to my breast pocket, I would go with downy. Not scientific, but um, neither am I. Um, sparrows. So we have a t we have sparrows moving through right now. Um, sparrows are a classic uh, identification difficulty. There's like a million species of them. They're all basically brown. Um, they don't, you know, they hide in the bushes and things, so they're they're hard to see. Um, these are three of our most common. Um, they are all around just about now. Um, they are um, a song sparrow there on the left, a chipping sparrow in the middle, and a white-throated sparrow. So white-throated is the easiest to identify of the three. They got a big white throat, okay? White-throated sparrow. And also the, the yellow uh, just above the eye and the black and white head stripes. Um, they are more commonly found on the ground. They will occasionally come to feeders, but most often will be found below the feeders eating seed off the ground. Um, they have a beautiful song, um, which sounds like, uh, I, I can't believe I'm going to sing on this thing, but, um, uh, oh, sweet Canada, Canada, Canada. Um, that's what it sounds like. Uh, it's a beautiful song. You'll know it when you hear it, trust me. Uh, in the middle is a chipping sparrow. Um, they are not quite here yet. They're still uh, migrating up from the south, um, but they should be here soon. Um, easy to identify if you can get a look at them. They have a plain breast. And then they have uh, a, a red cap with a white and black eye stripe. So black through the eye and then a white just below above it and then a red cap. Um, and then on the left there is a song sparrow. So these birds are, are in right now. They've migrated through my yard uh, after about you know a week ago not seeing these at all is now we have them all over. Um, song sparrow, um, pretty cryptic looking. Um, but if you look, they have a streaky breast with a spot right in the middle. Um, and then that other red arrow is pointing to their submustachial stripe. So it's like this kind of thick brown stripe that comes down from their beak. Um, that's a great way to tell yeah, you got a song sparrow. Um, I just have two more. Um, raptors are coming too, right? Uh, big, big birds are coming. Uh, and so it, it uh, don't forget to look up at the sky as you're outside feeding the birds. Um, these two birds are, are commonly seen flying over uh, many parts of Maine um, uh, and we're lucky to have them uh, in this, you know, 50s and 60s. These weren't flying uh, really anywhere um, because of DDT, but now each of these species has made a big rebound. Um, these, of course, are an osprey on the left and a, a juvenile bald eagle, an immature bald eagle on the right. Um, so how do you tell the difference between these two in flight? They look um, you know, they can be easily confused. Um, the osprey has that white belly and that crook in the wing there. You see it's got sort of that, um, that bump in the wing. Um, that is uh, really evident in flight and a good field mark. Um, so their wing is really sort of broken up into the two parts. Um, bald eagles, when they soar, their wings are basically straight across. Um, they have a very flat profile when they're soaring like that. Uh, and so, uh, which is unlike most species. Um, uh, the, the adult bald eagles are, are a little easier to tell apart, of course. They have the white uh, head and white tail with the, the solid sort of chocolate colored middle part and wings. Um, but it takes a few years to get there. Um, and so uh, it, while they're growing up, they look different. They, they're sort of speckled brown and white all over. Um, and so um, um, that's a good way to tell them apart. I'm trying to figure out how to field a question. Um, from David, I don't see it up there. So if it's possible to uh, chat it to me, that would be great. But I can't, I don't see the option to answer a question. Apologies. Um, so I'll answer that when I can see it. Um, finally, 
uh, I wanted to just cover a few red birds, right? Just red ones. Um, these are three uh, birds that you may see at your feeders. The, the ones on the outside are much more common year round at our feeders. The one in the middle is a beautiful migratory bird that'll be coming through uh, next month, mostly. Um, they're all red and black, mostly. Um, which are which? Um, of course, we have the cardinal over there. I uh, uh, hope folks got that one. Um, cardinal, beautiful bird, actually um, more, sort of a recent arrival in Maine. Um, they didn't used to be so common in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, but now they've come in uh, with a vengeance, mostly as humans have planted uh, shrubs and things around their houses that they like. Uh, on the far side is a house finch. Um, another bird that is not native to Maine, actually, it's native to the American Southwest. Um, the story with the house finches is that they were a, a popular cage bird uh, pet back in the early uh, 20th century when the Migratory Bird Treaty was act uh, was passed. Uh, all these pet stores said like, oh, I can't keep these anymore. So they just sort of opened their doors and all the house finches flew out. Uh, and now they have uh, colonized the entire East Coast and are a very common bird uh, in, uh, on the East Coast. In the middle is just a mwah, beautiful bird, scarlet tanager. Um, this photo does not do them justice. They're like, they're like uh, eye searingly red and, and um, beautiful jet black wings. Beautiful birds. Um, they may come to uh, eat uh, your feeders, especially if it's a colder spring like it was last year. Um, but you also may see them passing through um, high up in the treetops. Nancy Ohm says, says, what about purple finches? Yeah, they're here too. I thought about putting them on, but I wanted to do a tanager instead. Um, purple, feet, purple finches are, they look a lot like house finches. They are more purple all over. So you see the house finch sort of has that um, limited on the head and the breast. Purple finches extends a lot more. Um, purple finches also have sort of more brownish action going on on the, on the head. Um, purple finches will readily come to feeders. Um, I had a wave of them at mine last week. Um, they're more common, I would say, in the, in the northern uh, woodsier parts of the state, um, but they are around too. House finches are much more common in sort of the more developed um, urban and suburban parts. Um, Richard, uh, do we not get Baltimore Orioles here? Uh, we sure do. We do get Baltimore Orioles, absolutely. Um, they'll be coming in, in, uh, in May primarily and setting up shop. Uh, and so uh, keep an eye out. Um, again, try to put some jelly out or some half uh, citrus fruits to attract them. Um, but also you could check out um, um, anywhere with like sort of open orchardy trees. So the, the one that jumps ahead is River Point Park in West Falmouth. Um, that is a great place for Baltimore Orioles. They, they stay high up in the trees and so they can be hard to see. So you gotta be diligent. Most people don't necessarily have feeders. We're just outside walking around in hoods and woods. Um, that's great too. Um, uh, birds are here. Um, birds are birds are everywhere. It's a great thing about birds is that you can be in your backyard with feeders or you can look out in the trees to see them. Um, and yeah, so um, Abby, yes, I thought I'd be in Q&A now. Um, so if you could send them to me in the chat, um, I'm happy to do that. Or if you want to wait until the very end, we could do that as well. I think let's take a pause for the, the bird Q&As right now. Um, okay. And also, I wanted to flag for folks that are joining via the phone who can't see the chat that we are recording this meeting and we'll send it around later. Um, Miranda asked it, uh, where folks can access those interactive migratory maps you were sharing. With the sure. Um, those are on an excellent, excellent, excellent website called eBird. So if you go to eBird.org, and you click on the science tab, I believe, um, you can find your way to their uh, migratory maps. eBird is an incredible website. It is built on citizen science. So um, as birders from around the country and world submit their bird sightings, it all goes into this huge database uh, uh, from which scientists can derive these very, very detailed maps of where birds are, when they're moving, um, how their populations are being impacted. So um, I, I highly encourage all of you to go uh, check out eBird, open your own account so you can submit sightings that you have in your backyard. Um, you can also please submit them to the Maine Bird Atlas, which is a, a project that Maine Audubon is working on with the state of Maine to take a census of all the birds in the state, um, updating the last one we did in the 80s. Um, so uh, check out some information there on ebird.org. All right, um, a few different folks have asked about um, 
brown tail moth caterpillar. So one question is, are there any birds that eat them? And if yeah. not, any birds eat them? Yeah, there are birds that eat them. Um, brown tails are a tough one. Um, they are a native species. Um, they, um, I'm not really sure, frankly, why birds don't do a better job, uh, you know, how, how their numbers have explained, exploded so much in the presence of birds. Um, uh, and so um, birds I, will eat them in small numbers, um, but they're not a favored food source. Um, they have those hairy defenses, and so they're not as uh, maybe suitable as some other caterpillars. But unfortunately, I don't think birds are quite the answer of, of, for the brown tail moth problem. Okay, um, folks are, are suddenly sending a lot of questions, so I'm trying to, to uh, sift through. Another one on brown tail moths while we're on that topic. Um, yeah. Their name, we're wrapping oak trees to deter invasive moths. Are we hurting other helpful moth caterpillars at the same time? Yep, uh, yep. A lot of actions that are taken against certain invasive uh, insects will hurt other insects. Um, <laughs> that's part of the difficulty of managing for, for species, frankly, is, uh, is how to get around that. Um, I, you know, my understanding is that, you know, scientists are working all the time to try to, you know, make more targeted solutions or other options, but, um, but yeah, when you, when you wrap a tree and often when you, when you spray chemicals, you're hurting um, not just your target species, but, but others as well. Including birds? Um, not necessarily. I mean, you're excluding the birds from the trees, uh, but unless you're wrapping birds in there, then you're not hurting the birds uh, in particular. It depends. There's lots of different management solutions. Sometimes when people put up netting uh, to deter certain things, that can uh, hurt birds if they get tangled in there. Um, so no, you're sort of excluding the birds from um, the tree, but you're not necessarily harming them. Are there any brown tail moth um, treatments that Maine Audubon does recommend, or is that something that's still a good area. Yeah, we do a, a, a few uh, organic treatments at our property in Falmouth. I, I don't want, I don't know the specifics of those. I'm, I'm happy to put you in touch with our properties folks who, who think about this issue a lot. Um, but, um, and so that's what I would recommend. There are various things to do, including pruning um, and then um, some chemical treatments if, if that's what you feel is necessary. Um, but I don't know enough about them to, to say right now. So uh, please email me if, uh, if you'd like to, more information. Yeah, that was a really common question for folks. So we'll, we'll look into it and talk to other, other people okay. who are better than us and we'll everyone that attended. Uh, I was trying not to think of any bad things coming up. I was hoping on, I was focusing on the good birds, uh, I don't know, brown yeah. tails, man. All right, we'll get, we'll get to some, some lighter bird questions. Uh, All right. What, well, this isn't more positive. What can folks do about English sparrows that grab all the birdhouses? Yeah. Um, so English sparrows, also known as house sparrows, are uh, a non-native species introduced from Europe. Um, they also, I mean, they're fairly benign, I would say, overall. Their biggest, they, they live mostly in cities uh, where they, you know, peck around on the ground. They do uh, take over nest boxes. Um, the number one thing you can do is make sure that you are using the proper hole. So um, it, it, the, the biggest problem with house sparrows is that when a hole is uh, put out that's too big for the bird it's intended for, a house sparrow can take it over. Uh, and so um, make sure you go to that nest watch site and are using the proper sized hole. Uh, and there's other deterrents on there that may help you with um, how, keeping house sparrows out of there. But, um, you know, it's, it's hard. Uh, it's hard. It's hard to do. Right. We're also getting a lot of questions about bird houses, bird feeders. Um, I think a good common question would be like, what's, what's the best all around bird feeder someone could have? Sure. You know, there's lots of good options. In my backyard, I have a couple. I have one that's a, a plastic dome. So it's got a little uh, cup here that has a seed and then a dome over the top. Um, I like this one a lot because uh, it doesn't get wet. So it keeps um, snow and water away from the seed, which has been really helpful. Um, I also use uh, a, a thin tube feeder, uh, which I keep thistle in. So thistle is a very small, thin seed that is favored by finches, like goldfinches and um, uh, pine siskins and birds like that. Um, it needs a very small feeder because it otherwise will sort of fall out. 
So I have a small uh, uh, one for that. That's also sold in like these mesh socks that uh, birds can pick out, but otherwise it keeps the seed in. Um, I also have a tray feeder. And so this is sort of a, uh, an open square flat um, with uh, mesh on the bottom so water can fall through and also other you know, waste. Um, but that's nice and open so it allows bigger birds to come and perch there and hang out. Um, there's really no, um, nothing I sort of don't recommend as far as feeders. Um, and honestly, uh, it's best to experiment with different seed mixes and different um, placements of your feeders and different styles um, to see what works the best for you. Do folks clean out their birdhouses every year? Yeah, if you, um, so birdhouses are not in use uh, when, when nesting is over and that's largely um, the, you know, the late summer, uh, depending on how the, the, the babies did. So uh, by the time it gets uh, September or so, uh, feel free to uh, clean those things out and, uh, and um, maybe put a little, some wood chippings in there, um, some wood shavings uh, for next year. And are there any magic bird feeders that keep squirrels out? You know, squirrels uh, are very smart and they're very hungry. Um, at Maine Audubon, what we've done is just, we put some seed right on the ground. You know, they, we were sick of them knocking over our feeders. And so we were like, here, you win. Here's some seed on the ground. What that does is it keeps the squirrels down low and stops them from, you know, knocking stuff out. There's all kinds of approaches. I, out, outside, I use a baffle, which is just like a pie plate that's on the pole that I have and, the, and bird and squirrels don't get there. Although they probably could, I think they're just being nice to me. Um, there are other feeders that, um, have a thing where if a squirrel gets on it, it sort of slides down and covers the hole. That um, may be effective. Um, one thing, the only thing we, re we really ask you not to do is use any grease. Some people put like grease on their poles so squir squirrels will slide off. Um, don't do that. That's actually very dangerous to the squirrel's fur and also to the bird's feathers if it gets on them. And so um, so you're, you're welcome to do what you need to do, but don't use grease. All right, let's move into some questions about birds themselves. Um, yeah. First of all, we had wanted to um, play bird songs on this, but the yeah. technology was a little tricky. Is there a good yeah. site that folks can go to to hear the bird songs that you've talked about? Sure, absolutely. Um, the ebird.org site um, has uh, bird songs for every species. Um, also, uh, another website from Cornell called All About Birds dot org or dot com i think dot org um, we'll have all the calls um, down there for you to play um, there are web there are apps being developed um, that will allow you to play you know to like record a song that you're hearing outside and then it'll tell you what bird is making that um, that uh, the apps that i've used aren't quite there yet um, but that technology is improving all the time um, and so if you do a search for bird, you know, bird call app, that could help. Um, I use an app called Sibley on my phone, uh, which is related to the Sibley guide for birds. This is one that um, you need to pay for, but I think it's worth it. It's the best uh, sort of app field guide slash call um, uh, one that there is. And so I look that at Sibley. Yeah, S-I-B-L-E-Y. So if you type in Sibley birds, it'll, it'll show you. Um, those are the ones that I'd recommend. Um, you know, bird calls are, are tough. Uh, it takes a long time to sort of get into practice and, and, uh, and recognize what you're hearing, but it does, it is rewarding and you do um, hear a lot more birds than you see. Someone is scolding you as a main Audubon employee for not saying that the Audubon app is great and has sound. Okay, Audubon app too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maine Audubon is, uh, is separate. We're, we're great friends with National Audubon, but we're a completely separate organization. Um, and so that's why I wasn't thinking about right. it. I love you, National Audubon. You're great. Um, folks have asked a lot of questions about specific bird species and migrations. Um, yeah. Kind of hard to pick one. Um, do sandhill cranes come to Maine to nest or do they just fly through? They do nest in small numbers. Um, we have a few sandhill cranes. Um, for one reason or another, their sort of stronghold in the state is um, the Belgrade area. And so up near Mesolonsky uh, Lake, you, we have some, uh, a few pairs of sandhills. There may be a few others that I'm unaware of in the sort of Bangor area. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the large amounts of sandhill cranes uh, move sort of up and down the middle of the, of the country. 
um, between you know the southern US and Canada um, but we have a sort of small and growing population here uh, in Maine. Um, folks have a lot of other great questions but Nick does have a, a hard stop at one so um, it's true move on to the next part and if we if we end up with a couple more minutes we can ask some more bird questions and, and i should say too please email maine audubon uh, naturalist at maineaudubon.org uh, with any of your bird questions any wildlife questions at any time uh, we have a new column in the in this uh, press herald on every sunday where we answer naturalist questions called ask a naturalist um, most of these are answered by my colleague doug who's much smarter than i am and so you'll be certain to get the right answer um, so uh, Thank you. All right, and Nick, I think next you're going to tell us briefly about um, climate change impacts on birds. Or did you do that? And I missed. Oh, it. I'll do that. I had your slide first. Um, you want me to go do mine? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. Climate change and birds. Um, Maine is seeing the impacts of climate change, and Maine birds are are seeing the impacts of climate change. Um, here's one species uh, here that was not around. Uh, until very recently, and we know that is moving in part because of climate change. Um, uh, this is the, the very uh, poorly named uh, red-bellied woodpecker. Um, it's got a red head. There's another woodpecker with a red head that you're, when you see it, you're like, okay, that's the red-headed. So this is a red-bellied woodpecker. If you can sort of see a little red belly between the legs there. Um, for the longest time, this bird sort of um, epitomized uh, the south uh, and the southeast. Uh, but we, but they have moved up and we know because of um, something called Bergman's rule and how species grow over their north south ranges um, that these birds are moving and growing as they get further north, uh, which means that they are adapting to colder to new temperatures uh, because of climate change. Um, a couple other species that um, are uh, more recent uh, visitors and um, species in Maine. Um, the Carolina wren there on the left with the, the beautiful little eye stripe. Um, it's called the Carolina wren. Uh, it typically was a southern bird, but is moving into the state. Um, also eastern bluebirds. Um, this is one that um, they are wintering much more in the state than they used to because of uh, milder winters. Also because people are planting uh, more uh, fruit trees and berry trees that they, allow, that they can eat through the winter. Um, but this is another bird that um, didn't used to live here. Um, the real sort of um, hard information about um, climate change that has come out recently and its impact on Maine birds um, comes from the National Audubon Society. Um, they released a port, uh, report a couple months ago called Survival by Degrees, uh, which models out um, how climate change will impact habitats um, over the next 50 years uh, under some different scenarios and what that might mean for birds around the country. Um, you know, we know that birds need specific habitats to live. Um, and they can't live in other habitats. For example, that boreal chickadee I showed you earlier, that needs to live in the boreal forests. So if you don't have boreal forests, you're not gonna have those birds. And so we know by modeling out how habitats might change due to different temperature uh, and other factors from climate change, we know what birds will go with it. And uh, you know, the results are not, uh, are, are not great. Um, um, the report lays out different scenarios. Um, so I have three of them here. Um, on the left side is uh, the current range of the particular bird. The middle slide is um, uh, a 1.5 degree increase by 2080, and then a three degree increase by 2080. Um, this is a slide here for common loons. Common loons are a, a beloved uh, breeding bird in Maine. Um, uh, you know, we're very proud. They're sort of a symbol, an iconic symbol of a Maine summer. Um, you see um, the red is habitat that is lost and the, the other darker orange is habitat that is um, deteriorating for these birds. And you see under a 1.5 degree scenario, um, some of the habitat they live in now, they breed in, um, is disappearing in Southern Maine. Uh, under a three degree scenario, it's basically, they'll basically be out of Maine uh, in terms of breeding. They may still winter here, but they won't be here um, during the summer. Same goes for this beautiful bird. This is a bobolink, um, a beautiful crazy blackbird with a yellow cap. Um, they breed in grasslands and meadows uh, around the state currently, um, but their habitat is going to push north uh, likewise, uh, and they will be out of the southern part of the state uh, under a 1.5 degree and um, basically out of the state, um, uh, the red areas in a three degree. Oops. 
Um, I should say too that, you know, uh, changing habitat would benefit some other birds. Um, this is that wood thrush that I showed at the very top. Um, it's got a, a range that basically Maine is at the sort of northern end of their range. Um, climate change will push them north and actually may ex uh, improve their habitat in Maine uh, as we go forward uh, and as they push north. You know, that's, uh, it's not good or bad, um, but that's the reality of what will happen. Um, some species will benefit in certain ways from uh, changing habitats. Um, others will be really pushed out. Um, if you go to the report on the National Audubon website, you can see on the, uh, there's a main section, you can see a real good summary of what's going to happen. Um, they expect uh, to some of these birds. Um, basically, the gist is that uh, birds that, that rely on the boreal forests, birds that are really unique to Maine, um, birds that we have here that a lot of states don't have, um, are really going to be hit hard as that boreal forest is projected to move north out of the state. Um, yeah, so other birds uh, may see their range increasing, others will see them decreasing, but uh, we're in for some changes for sure. So let me make sure I stop now and turn it back over to Abby for this slide. Thank you, Nick. Um, after hearing about how Maine's birds, particularly those in the boreal forest, are being impacted by climate change, you might all be wondering what you can do to help. Um, this year, our state is drafting their climate action plan which will commit our state to reducing carbon pollution by 45% by 2030 and by at least 80% by 2050. Um, and it will also aid communities in adapting to the serious and costly changes being wrought by the climate crisis and build a clean energy economy for all new people. Uh, Maine Conservation Voters and Maine Audubon are serving on several of the Climate Council's working groups and along with partners across the state we're using those roles to make Mainers' voices heard in this process. Um, you can take action right now by sending our petition to the Climate Council, which is calling for a strong and equitable climate action plan. And I will send that link through the chat to you all right now. Um, and we'll also keep you updated on more opportunities where you can make your voice heard in the process. Um, let me grab that link real quick um, and you can go to the next slide, Nick. Um, mainly just this last point is to thank you all so much for being part of our first virtual lunch and learn. After this, you're all going to be emailed a brief survey. Um, we welcome your feedback, so please take just a couple moments to fill it out. Um, and if you have enjoyed this event, I encourage you to join our future virtual lunch and learns. Um, our next one, we're still nailing down the details of um, date and time, but it will be about spring planting. So for you gardeners or aspiring gardeners out there, um, stay tuned and we will uh, email out details about that soon. Um, if you are not on our email list, you can sign up by going to our website, maineconservation.org, which I'll send through the chat. Um, scroll to the bottom and there's a link to add your email. Um, it looks like we have Four minutes left. Nick, would you be up for, for yeah. a couple more questions? Um, Hit me. Feel free to chat new questions if you have any questions about climate change or Maine's climate council process. Um, and in the meantime, I'll, I'll read another about birds. Um, has the range of cardinals extended farther into Maine because of climate change? Um, well, so the, the causes are a little bit are, are complicated. It's not necessarily just climate change for cardinals. Um, uh, people attribute it largely or in large part to um, humans planting really good habitat for cardinals. Cardinals love little shrubs and bushes and places, dense things they have to hang out in. Um, as humans um, ha have planted a lot of those in their backyards and, and shrubs, um, that's given a lot more habitat for cardinals. And so um, uh, the, the weather ha is improved for them and so their range has expanded, but also humans have sort of facilitated that. So it's a little bit of both. Um, but yeah, they're, the cardinals were very, very rare in Maine in the 50s and 60s, um, and, and now they live all over Maine and even in, into uh, you know Nova Scotia and parts of Canada. Uh, and so they're a bird that certainly has expanded its range quite a bit in just a few decades. I just sent out the petition link to the chat. Um, Another bird question. Um, you actually already answered this one. Someone was asking about the about bluebirds. Um, hey. 
how many kinds of warblers are there? Oh, uh, there is. <laughs> so in Maine, we have about uh, 20, I'm going to say 28 different species of warblers. Uh, and, you know, some, sometimes we get rare, you know, more rare ones that, um, you know, overshoot their migration uh, down south and, and show up in Maine. Uh, but, you know, if you were to go to, say, you know, Rangeley in uh, early June, you could, on a really good day, you could get um, 25 plus different uh, species of warbler. Can you explain what boreal forest means? Yeah, boreal is the name. I think it. I think it in Latin it means north, like aurora borealis. Um, it's the name for uh, the. If you think of like um, a, a deep Maine woods, um, you're thinking about the boreal forest. It's these um, these uh, uh, woods dominated by spruce and fir um, that um, and not dominated by things like hardwoods and things that we have in the eastern forests further south. Um, and so it's basically a dominant forest type in northern Maine and then um, through many parts of Canada um, that uh, produces tons of insects and is home to billions and billions of birds. Uh, people refer to the boreal forest as the baby bird factories of North America. Uh, and so they are um, really important to protect. Uh, Maine has a lot of boreal forest, uh, you know, uh, much more than any, anywhere else in the, in the east outside of maybe the Great Lakes um, or so. Um, New York has some in the in the Adirondacks, but Maine is really a stronghold of boreal uh, on, in the East Coast. All right, um, I think that's a good place to wrap it up. Thank you all so much again for joining us, and thank you, Nick, for teaching us all about. Thanks for joining, everybody. Um, hope you're doing well. Hang in there. Stay safe. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.